I've been running it for many, many years. Um, and so that's one piece of the direct services that we offer. We serve meals there and, and, and that sort of thing, but the playful community. It's especially important now in Portland because of the gentrification that has hit North and Northeast Portland. And many of our seniors who have always called that area their home, they could walk to their churches and be near their friends and their stores were there and all of that, have been uh, shifted out of that community for a number of different reasons. But the center is still there. They can still go there every day to see their friends uh, and to have community. So it's a very important piece of the work we do. Um, there's also, so that's part of our direct services. We deliver other direct services like helping keep seniors in their homes, so folks to check on them and provide, you know, whether it's cleaning, someone needs to help bathe them or make sure their home is safe with fire extinguishers and rugs tacked down and all, all of that stuff that you can imagine. And our focus is on, frankly, uh, elders who would otherwise be ignored. That, that's, our, that's our work. Um, and that's a rather large department for us. We have a smaller department called Healthy Families that helps get people enrolled in healthcare. We know we did a really good job in the state of getting folks signed up for healthcare, despite the cover of the debacle. We <laughs> still nailed it. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were still some people who um, didn't know what the, the, those silly commercials and stuff. So there's some people who didn't see those. Um, lucky for them. And there's some folks who just weren't involved in the process of getting signed up. So one of the services we provide is actually wrapping our arms around folks and saying, okay, here's how it works. Come with us. Let's get you signed up and walk you through the process. We'll fax the forms. We'll deal with all the um, all the ins and outs to get you and your family uh, signed up for healthcare. It's one of the services that we offer. Uh, and another area of direct services that we offer really relates to workforce. Uh, you know, I started off with the idea that folks don't have jobs. It's hard to assert your civil rights when you're hungry, when you're homeless, those kind of things. So a job is a basic tenant for us. We help people from everything from, we provide a computer lab where you can go and actually look for jobs, work on your resume. Uh, there's a phone there that has a phone number that you can use on your applications if you don't have a phone yourself, we actually answer it. So, hey, uh, yeah, they're been like, well, great, yeah, yeah, we can take a message for John here. That kind of thing. So it doesn't matter whether you are houseless or you don't have a phone or not, but you can still have an opportunity to give a potential employer the kind of information you need to give in order to successfully apply for a job. We do other things like training folks um, and providing support. Uh, if you don't have ID, it's mighty hard to get a job as a forklift driver, even if you're trained. And you know, it takes X number of dollars to get to DMV and to do all the stuff you gotta do. We help provide people that, that kind of support to, to, to get through that process, to really help them get jobs. Uh, we even provide bus tickets for that matter. Trying to get to and from interviews, here, here's some bus tickets to make that happen. Trying to get to and from our office to look for jobs, again, here's some bus tickets to help make that happen. So those are some of the direct services we provide in addition to a youth summer camp and after school leadership programs for kids. Uh, one of the great things about our youth program, and I'm happy to say, I'm my five and a half months there, uh, one of the first things that I wanted to do was to reinstate our, um, our year-round youth programming. We have a very robust summer program that's in our workforce uh, department. The idea, we're not putting kids to work in middle school and high school, but we are exposing them to different careers. Everything from what it means to be a member of the IBAW, Right. What do electricians actually do? How do you become one? What's, a, what's, a, um, what's an apprentice? What's a journeyman? All that, right? We bring carpenters in and we have kids actually have those conversations and be exposed and then we take them on job sites. Mm -hmm. So they can act, so they can see what that's like. Because you know, if you don't have a carpenter in your family, they build stuff. Well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so we show kids what that's like in middle school and high school and also the 18 to 24 year olds, some of whom may or may not have gotten out of high school and then kind of floundered around and then they figure out, oh, I want to do something. We help to engage them through that program. So it's camp, and it's fun because they're learning stuff, but it's very much focused on workforce and sort of what do you want to be when you grow up. Uh, so that's a piece of what we do, but the year-round programming for you is something we haven't had in many years, but it's something that I grew up with, uh, and it's, it's, I'm really proud that we have reinstated that. One of the best things about our offering is that all of this stuff I've mentioned to you thus far is free. So we don't charge folks when they show up at our door saying, I need help with X. When a kid comes to our camp, it doesn't matter whether uh, their parents own McDonald's franchises, and we have a couple of kids that fall into that category, or whether their parent works at McDonald's franchise. We don't charge anything. All those kids walk into the door exactly the same. They're going to be eating the same stuff and doing the same stuff, and it's such an amazing energy that these kids are able to create, and, they're, and to create their own community amongst themselves that, they, that does not exist in other places spaces that they occupy. So I had hoped that would happen, but seeing it happen in reality, super cool. Yeah.
Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I was really energized about me making that a year-round program, so kids could continue to have that connection, not have to wait till summertime hit again. Uh, and they have to do their homework, you know, while they're with the students. It works out really nicely. Uh, that's the direct services uh, side of our task. We help with housing supports and do some other things like that, but I'll move on to the advocacy side. So that's the part that may interest some of you a little bit more, because that's our statewide work. Uh, when you talk about ban the box, you know this past year, past session, the um, legislature passed ban the box. That was the Urban League's uh, bill. Oh. Drafted it and all that stuff. <clears throat> and they watered it on down in the Senate. Yeah. That's all right. We won't talk about that right now. Uh, but they got something passed, and we are pleased about that first step. But that's the kind of advocacy work we do. And certainly it helps African Americans. Certainly it matters to folks in North and Northeast Portland. But you better believe that's important for Oakland across the state. Right, there's plenty of uh, young white guys in Medford who really care a lot that we were able to pass me in the box on a statewide level. And now our advocacy continues in Portland, where we're hoping is not the right word. We are on the verge of uh, having the city council pass a much stronger uh, version of Ban the Box that we then hope to bring to Eugene and Bend and Salem. Notice I didn't say Salem second, because you know, we're going to have to ramp up a little bit. <laughs> a little momentum is going to be necessary down here, uh, but to other parts of the state to really have the kind of um, ordinances in place that we wanted the statewide legislation to be. That involves a lot of skirmishes with folks who are more money than we are. Uh, when something like Band the Box comes up and we decide to push it, there are people on my board who are part of big companies, Wells Fargo and Bank of America and, uh, and UPS and others, and those companies are parts of the Portland Business Alliance, which is, you know, the big chamber of commerce in our state. Mm -hmm. uh, my predecessor was unlucky enough to be the recipient uh, of lots of phone calls from folks on our board saying, hey, my company currently doesn't like Band the Box, and uh, I'm on your board, and we give you a lot of money, and we sure wish you could stop. Mm -hmm. Well, goodness gracious. So we do advocacy on behalf of folks who need us most. We need their money to help us do that. But I'm really happy to work with an organization where my predecessor said, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, sure. Yeah, we hear you. That's really important, but no. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Uh, and I got to come in at a time where I could then step up uh, further and say, ooh, we might need to make an example of someone. Some company might actually want to say, you know what, we're going to withdraw from your board because we opposed this so strong. All right, bring that. <laughs> right? Be the company that says, we're so against this that all the other things that you heard me mentioning that we do for young people, that we do for seniors, that we do to help folks with health care uh, and education and housing and all that, you want to step away from all of that because you disagree with us on this policy issue? Man, that sounds a little bit evil. <laughs> Not for me to say, but I'm sure someone will. <laughs> Luckily. Uh, folks managed to sort of see the light for themselves and we didn't have to have that kind of interaction. But sometimes it does get a little rough because we do advocacy. Then there are folks who say, well, what do you care so much about this issue? Um, there are other things that we are, uh, that we are in favor of and that we help to push with regard to health care, things that we do in coalition, raise the minimum wage. We're in two different raise the minimum wage coalitions. Uh, because it just needs to be raised, whether it's the 13 or it's the 15. We're on board for all of that. Mm -hmm. There's some folks who aren't really thrilled with that idea. People say, well, why don't you just focus on this stuff in Portland? Because, you know, it's different in Portland. It's different in Salem. The cost of living is different in Ashland. So, well, Medford. Uh, it's expensive in Ashland. Uh, so why don't you just focus up? No, because our advocacy work is statewide and that matters. The other bit is this. Uh, although African Americans are the primary uh, part of our mission, right? We know black folks live in every county in this state. We got the data to prove it, and we even got pictures, because some folks don't believe it. We went out of our way to make sure. They're really, they're there. Uh, um, sometimes that's what it takes. So we can say, when we're doing statewide advocacy, it's still for black folks, because black folks live all over the state. Here's a little bit I'm going to share with you, and I'm not going to talk a lot about the state of black women tonight. I would like to have an opportunity at some point in time to talk about it. Um, the State of Black Organists report that the Urban League issues about every five years. And uh, this document is uh, filled with about two and a half years of research and analysis uh, and action steps focused on some of the issues that matter to us most. So education policy and housing and issues with elders and incarceration and education. All of these things we look at in a holistic way. In past years, we would have done that in silos. So at the education chapter, 
this is the housing chapter. That's the, and we realized that that doesn't work because all of those things are interconnected. So this is the first time we were able to really look at those synergy, I don't know, I'm using that word a little too much, but synergistically. Uh, and then to talk about what needs to be done to, um, to, to stop admiring the problem. We, uh, as Oregonians, are really good, and Democrats, frankly, we're really good at admiring problems. This is the problem. Let's look at it from all kinds of different ways. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? That was last year we looked at it. Let's look at it again. <laughs> um, and it's tough. That's one of the things about being a pretty blue state. There, we don't have, in my opinion, uh, enough forces pushing on us to make us get it done. Hurry up. Uh, and folks will say, well, let's study that some more. Let's make a work group or a task force. We really need to get behind the data and the numbers. And all that stuff's important. So we did that. And then we put together action steps. So we no longer have to admire the problem. We can say, here, here, just go do those five things. When we're done with that, we can come back and admire the problem further if it's not fixed. <laughs> How about that? Deal? Uh, that, and we put in lots of great pictures and lots of infographics to make it um, more accessible. So it's full of lots of data. Uh, but it's also an easy read because it's a gorgeous looking uh, book and it's written for people who don't read white papers for a little bit. So, I'll put that down for a moment. The, how am I doing on time? Just a couple minutes? A couple minutes. Okay. It's like you're done with time. Sit down. <laughs> uh, 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 so a couple more minutes and I'll, I'll just, I'll wrap it up. So, the, but the, the, the thing about this, it's called the State of Black Organ and some folks say, okay, that's great. But you know, I'm in a county where there are two black people, so it doesn't really make that difference. Not that much difference. Well, here's what I'd love to share with people. The things that will help make African Americans in the state more secure economically also help white folks. Mm-hmm. Yes. Latinos and Asians and others too. Mm -hmm. Oregon is a pretty poor state compared to other states. Look toward look to the north, look to the south. Mm -hmm. We're not doing so hot in the pocketbook. The good thing about that is it means we're all in a similar, most of us are in a similar boat, right? There's still nine and there's the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, a uh, few timber guys, but they usually, they're quiet nowadays. <laughs> uh, so that gives us an opportunity to work together on these issues. Housing is a pinch for lots of folks who live in Portland and in, and in Boardman, right? It just is. Jobs and access to them is a pinch regardless of the color of your skin in this state. We know that's true. So some of the things that we have put forward aren't just this is only gonna help black people. Absolutely not, because that's not how policy works. It just so happens that that's our focus, but we tell folks, tell you what, if you need to do it, remove the word black from the sentence. X initiative will also help young white guys in Pendleton because they're just as hard up as young black guys in North Florida. The same Amen. reason that a young yeah, white yeah. woman uh, in Southern Oregon doesn't get early prenatal care when she's pregnant, guess what? Similar reasons why a Latina in East County, Portland, doesn't get early prenatal care. There aren't doctors near where she lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no transportation near her, uh, near where she lives, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Maybe no health insurance, no job. All these things, same. Medford or Eastern, uh, East County, uh, Portland. The fixes for those things, also similar. One of the reasons that that's so important is because it means we can't let our elected officials off the hook. It doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter what part of the state you're in, you need to fund transportation adequately. And, and we talk about how yeah. that's done here, right? <laughs> and don't do it because it's for black people. Don't do it because it's for Portland. This urban rural divide and that stuff. Mm. Oh, so sick of it. I didn't grow up with that idea in my head, and I don't know where it's come from. But we've got some solutions that can help us knock through that and work together on things that are really so uh, I invite you to um, use this as a manual. Um, for those of you who are interested, you don't have to read the whole thing, but you could because it's pretty easy reading. Uh, it's on our website, ulpdx.org, so you can download it there and grab it. The pictures are awesome there, too. We also have hard copies that you can buy. If you're curious and are looking for something that's pretty handy to use, Senators Merkley, Senators Wyden, they, they got this and this, OK. And I've actually heard them use it in their remarks, which is how I know how good it is, because they've got access to the best research, frankly, in the country. But this is just a little bit easier to grab and go. So I'm hoping to share it with other folks like us who don't have all that power behind us, uh, but who also want to talk about important issues. So that's the, one of the other things the urban does when it comes to advocacy. Uh, I'm going to stop there, but I thank you very much for that.